The book of James was one of the books, one of the most practical books in the New Testament. The book was written by the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. The book was written by a half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ and it was written for the, you know, to, to the Jews who are scattered outside of Jerusalem. Next, the theological teachings of the book. The main argument that, uh, that uh, James was making in the book was that our walk, in other words, our action, is the natural result of a living faith. In other words, James is arguing that the, what we believe informs our action. And somebody can tell what we believe by the way that we behave. And James argued that our faith is what motivates and determines what drives our action. So the objective of the book was to see how a Christian can align their faith with the way they live on a daily basis. We closed out that particular session by going deep into the nature and the blessings of trial, where James was saying that we should count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptation. And again, we went into the reason why James spoke about the need for rejoicing in the time of trial. This evening, we are going to continue our study from the book of James. And this time around, we are going to be reading from verse number 9 all the way to verse number 21 of James chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, please open to James chapter 1. We will start reading from verse number 9. James chapter 1, reading from verse number 9. It said, let the brotherly love, let the brother, sorry, let the lowly brother glorify his exaltation. But the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat that it withers the grass. Its flowers fall and its beautiful appearance perish. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. Which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Nor does he, tempt, nor, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then when, that, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brother, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of light. With whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creature. So when, so then, my beloved brethren, let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of men does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. In Jesus name. Amen. Quickly a quick overview of what we have seen in the passage of scripture. The first thing I want you to notice there is the transient nature of life. The shortness of life. In verse number 9 James wrote. He said let the lowly brother glorify in his exaltation. But the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun arisen with a burning heat, than with the, then it withers the grass. Its flowers fall, its, beauty, its beautiful appearance perish, so that rich man also will fade away in his pursuit. In other words, James is saying, don't trust in your riches. Don't trust in your position. Don't trust in your exalted stature in life. Because life has nothing, you know, because in life, nothing lasts forever. That's basically what James is saying. Today you may be low. Tomorrow you find yourself exalted. Tomorrow you might be exalted. And unfortunately you might find yourself in a lowly position. And it gives the beautiful you know, illustration of a flower. Today is glowing in its radiance. Fully clothed. Very beautiful. But tomorrow because of the adverse condition. All that radiance and glow and beauty withers away. And so James is saying, make sure you remember every time that nothing in life lasts forever. One day you are radiant and beautiful. The next day there's withering and there's death. So he's saying the, it, it, the way, you know, anyone who trusts in riches might find out that the riches may not last forever. Number two thing that we see 
is the blessedness of endurance. The blessedness of endurance. Look at verse number 12. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised those who love him. In other words, James is saying, life will always have its up and down. Anyone who tells you that life is just going to be a smooth sail, that person is either has not experienced life or that person is lying. The truth of the matter is that life will have its up and down. But only the man or the woman who endures the challenging moments of life will be blessed. That's basically what, uh, that's basically what James is saying. In other words, he does, you know, life does not reward the quitters. That's what James is saying. Life does not reward the people that give up. Life does not reward the people who throw in the towel in difficult times. The only people life reward are those who are able to weather the challenges, the storm, and the trials of life. Only those who have developed the stamina to be able to stay the course in a difficult situation, those are the people that life rewards. Nobody rewards a quitter, a loser, or somebody who gives up. That's what, uh, that's what uh, uh, James is saying. The third thing I want you to notice is the source and the nature of temptation. The source and the nature of temptation. Look at verse number 13. He said, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then, when, tempt when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Here, James is telling us that temptation is not from God. And how do we know that? He said, because God cannot be tempted by evil, neither does God tempt anyone. You know what? God does not set you up to fail. That's basically what James is saying. Your God himself who has made us, God who has invested a lot in us, cannot set up to fail. He doesn't set his people up to fail. James is saying, God never ever tempts his own people. He said, God does not leave us hanging. God does not tell, you know, God is never the source of our temptation. So he says, so when you are going through, your challenges in life, when you are being tempted in one way or the other, he said, when you are looking for the source, don't look to God. Because God is never the source of our temptation. He's basically saying, when you give, you know, temptations come. When you are going through temptation, instead of looking at God, he said, look at yourself. Because the source of temptation, James is saying, it comes from our desire. He said, when we give in to our desire, when we yield to the suggestion to act contrary to the will of God, he said, that is where temptation is. And James is basically saying, the temptation is not the issue. It's your response to the temptation that is the problem. Okay? And then the fourth thing that we see is the source of good gifts in life. The source of good gifts in life. Reading from verse number 17, James wrote, he said, for every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth, by, his, by the word of truth. That we might be the first, by we might be a kind of a first fruit of his creature. In other words, James is saying, God is the author and the source of all good things that come into our life. It's not just the author and the good and the, and the source of all good things. He is the father of life. That means he's the sustainer. He's the one that continues to produce. And he has brought us forth to be the people that will represent his name here. And if God has done that, God will never leave you hanging. That's basically what he's saying. And then finally, he said the need for control and discipline in the life of a believer. That's the last thing we see in the passage of scripture we read. Reading from verse number 19, James said, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to run. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive the, with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Here James is telling us about the need for basic self-control, basic self-discipline. He's saying that control and discipline your mouth, control and discipline your anger. The, result, the reason is because if you don't control, if you don't discipline yourself, the result of your action will never glorify the name of the Lord. That's basically what he's saying. I've never seen a man who is angry glorifying God. I'm so pissed and I'm glorifying God. It doesn't work that way. I'm so angry and I'm talking rubbish and that rubbish is glorifying God. It doesn't work that way. He's saying that the wrath of man does not produce righteousness of God. In other words, you cannot lose your cool. You cannot be under, you know, you cannot be totally, completely angry and still be glorifying God. See, that does not work that way. Well, 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 
Our lives will not produce the result that is good in the name of the Lord if we do not know how to control or discipline ourselves. So he's basically saying self-control, self-discipline. That is what will be able to help you as you take in the word of God to structure your life. That's the high level overview of verse 9 all the way to verse number 21 of the verse of scripture that we've read. Now, central to this verse of the scripture are the areas that we want to focus our attention on this very evening. I want you to go back to James chapter 1 and we start reading again from verse number 12. And we read from 12 to 15. In James chapter 1, reading from verse number 12 to 15, the Bible says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he is approved, they will, be, they will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. But let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings death. Basically, James is saying, to keep the most of what life has to offer. To keep the key to making life, you know, to making the most of life. The key to accessing and blessing, the, uh, and the accessing the blessedness of endurance. The key to accessing and enjoying the best gift that God has to offer. The key to living a life of control and discipline is found in understanding and the workings of what is called temptation. When you understand the nature and the walking of temptation, you know how it operates, and you are able to overcome it, then you'll be able to access the blessings that God has in store for you. In other words, James is saying, the man or the woman, that the, the man or the woman that makes the most of what life has to offer, is the man that understands how temptation operates. How the devil used temptation to be able to get his way. And so in verse number 12, by James is talking about, he's talking about the blessedness of understanding uh, endurance. Number five, verse number 13, it talks about the origin of temptation. And then number 14 and 15, it talks about what I like to call the process of temptation. The process of temptation. Now, if you go back to that James chapter 1 and start reading from verse number 14 and 15, which is where we are going to camp this very evening. Verse 14 and 15, which is, you know, the Bible tells us, it says, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Here, there are two, here are the two verses of scripture that outline what I call the process of temptation. Looking at the process of temptation, James is basically saying, falling into temptation is not accidental. People don't sleep with another man's wife by accident. You don't do it. You don't steal another man's property by accident. Okay? You don't take what does not belong to you by accident. He said temptation, falling into temptation is not something that happened by accident. Falling into sin is not something that just happens out of the blues. I didn't know what was happening. All of a sudden, the man's money just stuck up into my pocket. It doesn't work that way. Sin does not just jump on you. It is not uncontrol It's not an uncontrollable, I can't help kind of situation. No. What James is saying that, what James is saying that there is a process that temptation follows before it becomes a problem in the life of the people of God. And we need to you know, we might not know the process. We might not be conscious of the process. We might not even want to admit the process, but there is a process that the enemy follows to be able to trap the people of God and put them in bondage. There is a process that is being played out where people move from point A to point B in the process of sinning against the Almighty God and falling into temptation. And James is saying that the process of, the, that the process of temptation starts with a dormant desire. It starts with a dormant desire. That means a desire that has not been acted upon. Something at the back of your mind that is just sitting down there, waiting to be activated. Look at verse number 14. He said, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. 
In other words, the temptation is not something that happens out of the blue. There is a particular seed in the heart of the man that it's when you now begin to pay attention. When that seed comes, the Bible says that when you are drawn away by your own desire, that is when temptation begins to take place. He's saying temptation starts with the desire that draws us out of the path that we normally follow. This is the way I normally do things. But because of the temptation, what happens that I go out, I stray out of that path. Normally, I take my salary, I make sure I pay my bills, and I put whatever is left to be able to keep myself. But because somebody told me a story that looks so good, now I've taken my salary, and I've, won, I've gone ahead, and I've gone to play the lottery with it. And all of a sudden, I lost everything. It didn't just happen by accident. There is something at the back of your mind that motivated, that was triggered, that caused you to walk in that direction. So James is saying that the temptation, he says, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire. A desire to make, you know, a desire that make us to do what is against our better judgment. Look at Genesis chapter 3 for an, as an illustration. Genesis chapter 3. The Bible talks about an exchange between Adam, between Eve, and the serpent. Bible tells us that after that particular exchange, I want you to notice what the Bible tells us in verse number 6 of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 verse number 3. After the serpent had, after the serpent was to, uh, you know, after the serpent told Eve that she will not die when she eats the fruit. You remember the exchange? He said, what will happen to you when you eat the fruit? He said, God said, we should not touch it because when we eat it, we are going to die. Look at them, and then, the, then the serpent said, don't, yeah, don't, don't worry, if you, if you eat it, you shall not surely die. Your eyes will be open, you will know good from evil, and you will become like God. Now notice what happened to Eve immediately after that particular conversation in verse number 6. In verse number 6, the Bible says, So when the woman saw the tree that was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, it was a tree to be desirable, a desirable to make one wise. She took it, of, she took of his fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he did eat. Please notice that the Bible says that when the woman saw the tree, the tree did not just appear overnight. Okay, notice that there was not. This was not the first time that I, that Eve saw that particular tree. But something was arose, something was awakened after Eve had that conversation with the serpent and made her to see the tree in a different light. The tree was the same tree that she has been seeing every time when she went through that particular garden. Okay, After the conversation, something that was dormant inside of Eve came alive. And now she noticed what she did not, what she has not been paying attention to. All of a sudden, the Bible makes us understand that she saw the tree, which has already been there, has been there for, ever, you know, for, for only God knows how long. It's been there. All the serpent did was sow a seed and let the imagination of Eve take over. That's all. It just sowed a seed. That once you take this particular tree, everything will change for you. The serpent sowed the seed and her dormant desires were triggered. And all of a sudden, the ordinary tree in the garden became pleasant. The ordinary tree in the garden became desirable. The tree that she had not noticed before became a tree that she must eat and give to her husband. The question is, what changed? What changed? The tree did not change. The garden was not changed. Nothing changed in the garden. Everything was still where they were. The instruction that God gave was still the same. Eve was still the same person. That practically nothing has changed. If nothing changed, why then did Eve respond to the tree after the conversation? Why did her response change after the conversation? The simple reason was because Eve's curiosity was suddenly aroused as a result of the seed that the enemy sowed in her heart. Okay? Her unguarded heart was now polluted by the word from the serpent. And the dormant desire that was lying somewhere in her heart, all of a sudden was aroused. 
And in the process, the Bible makes us to understand that she, all the things that has been settled before were now turned on their head. That is why the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, if you read from verse number 23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it comes the issue of life. A heart that is unguarded is a fertile ground for the germination of the seed of temptation. Because inside your heart, there is a desire there. There is that particular Adamic nature that is always desiring to do things that are contrary to the will of God. And if you do not guard your heart, that is where temptation starts from. And that is why you find out that a man who is in love with money always falls when they present money to him. If a person loves, you know, if a person loves, uh, what do you call it, women, women become their source of downfall. I remember I was listening to a particular preacher. He said, it's going to be very difficult for you to poison me through alcohol. He said, why? Because I don't drink alcohol. You can't tempt me there. There is no desire in my spirit for that thing. So the enemy cannot use that particular desire against me. But the things that I desire, no matter how I try to look as if I don't like them, no matter how I try to present myself in the public that I don't like them, as long as that seed is in my heart, the enemy knows, and that is where temptation comes from. So James is saying, each of us are tempted when we are drawn away by our own desire. So the second thing, that's the first thing. Temptation comes when, you know, temptation comes when that particular, you know, when our dormant desires are aroused. The second reason why how temptation comes is when our imagination is enticed. When our imagination is enticed, uh, look at that same verse number 14. The Bible says each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Okay? Please understand that the word enticed means to be attracted artfully by arousing a hope or a desire inside of us. To be aroused means to be drawn, to draw our attention by promising a desirable outcome. And that is exactly what the serpent did. Exactly what he did. Notice the response of the serpent when Eve told, when Eve told the serpent that this is what God said will happen to us if we eat that truth. The Lord said you are going to die. Look at the response of the serpent, of the serpent in verse number 4. The Bible tells us, he said, then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. In other words, God has sold you a boatload of crap. You shall not surely die. For God knows that the day that you eat the, that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God lied to you. Okay? God lied to you because God, actually God not only lied to you, God did not, God was hiding the truth from you because he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to eat the fruit. He doesn't want your eyes open. He doesn't want you to be like him. But if you just eat the fruit, all your questions will be answered. Your desires will be met. Everything you are looking for in life will be settled. And before you know what's happening, you too, you have your own kingdom. You have your own garden of Eden. You can have your own mini, you know, mini people, mini Adams and mini Eve that will be running up and down that you can control. That was a nice thing in the ears of Adam, in the ears of Eve. It was music to her ears. And before you know what's happening, her imagination was entice. She can see herself being called the Queen Majesty. She can see herself walking around in the garden, you know, floating up and down, talking about, you know, she can just imagine how the galaxies will be bound down. Her imaginations were enticed. And the Bible tells us that before you know what was happening, the promise of the serpent was the promise of a revelation. She started to imagine revelations that will come to her. The promise of the serpent was the promise of enlightenment. She has beginning to imagine, look at all the things that I don't know that I'm going to know because I'm going to eat this particular fruit. The promise of the serpent was the promise of emancipation, the promise of self-determination, the promise of freedom, that yes, I'm not going to be free from the yoke of this Father God. I can now be self-determined. Those were the promises. The promise of being like a God. And as you see, the devil knows that the temptation does not work in isolation. For temptation to be a temptation, for temptation to work effectively, for temptation to be, you know, for us to be tempted, there must be something that is desirable about that temptation. And for Eve, it was the desire to know, the desire to be received revelation. 
They desire to be emancipated. They desire to be like God. Adam and Eve fell because they hoped that eating that fruit, accessing that tree, will give them the power to become gods. So you see, the root of temptation is a desire that the enemy exploits. So when he exploits that desire, he creates an illusion by exciting our imagination. And that's why he told Eve, say, when you eat that fruit, your eyes will open. As soon as you eat that particular tree, you will know good from evil. And by the time you eat that fruit, you will get the icing on the cake. You become God. Who doesn't want to become God? I mean, I want to become God so that nobody can begin to tell what's going on. But so that's what's going on. There was a promise, there was an enticement of the imagination, and people start to daydream. That's why they tell you, bring money, bring a dollar, you will get ten dollars. If you bring ten dollars, you will get a hundred. If you bring a hundred, you get a thousand. Bring a thousand, you get a hundred thousand. As soon as you hear hundred thousand, say, what? Look at hundred thousand. What is the Naira exchange right now? Six hundred and what? How much house am I can I build? Definitely I can build that particular house under that water. I can do this, I can do that. Look at all the good things that I can do. That is the promise that the enemy gives. And that is where temptation comes from. Number three. Temptation comes. The big problem. Temptation becomes a temptation when we engage the enticed imagination. When we engage the enticed imagination. Look at verse number four. You know, from verse number four. 14 and 15 of James chapter 1. The Bible says, but each of you, each one is tempted. When he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then number, verse 15 says, then when desires has conceived. In other words, when you have acted upon that particular desire. When you have acted upon that enticement. It gives birth to sin. And sin when it's full grown, brings forth deaths. Here James is saying. When your dormant desire, that secret thing that you are wishing for, is aroused and your imagination is fired, and you begin to see the possibility of what can be, James is saying the next step is the process of engaging that particular thought and thinking of a possible way to bring it to action. Now, for a minute, just imagine with me. If somebody comes to you and say, okay, and somebody comes to you and say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm giving you a suggestion. Why don't you just go ahead, look at the local bank there. I've looked at the security. I've looked at everything. It looks like it's very easy for you to just go in, do a stand-up, get the money, and get out. Okay? If you spend, if you don't engage that particular conversation, if you don't engage that thought, that person says it, and you don't pay attention to it, and you don't even think about it, there is a strong probability that you will never carry it out because you never thought about it. It was not something that was in your mind. You were not thinking about it. You were not ruminating about it. You were not even, you, were, you didn't even pay any means to it. You just let that thought go. You did not engage the thought. And as such, you will not, the chances of you, you know, carrying out that particular plot diminishes. But say for a second, you spent time thinking about it. Say what that guy said made sense. You started thinking about the idea. You began to imagine what you can do with the loot. Can I imagine? How much is even in that bank? Maybe a hundred thousand. Maybe a million. Maybe three million. What can I do with two million? All those children who are sick. All those ones that have cancer. I can cure all the cancer. I can create, you know, I can turn sliced bread into gold. I can do all this. I can become a Father Christmas overnight. I can become Santa Claus overnight. You start imagining what you can do with the loot. You convince yourself how much good you are going to do with that particular loot. Then you start weighing the odds. Then you begin to see the possibility. And before you know it, you start making plans. And if you, you know, and if you don't stop, what you will find is that you will start carrying out the act. It's the result, but you must remember the whole thing started with you just beginning to give some attention to a seed that was sown in your heart. And that's what James is saying. He said, temptation is not by accident. It comes by the desire. And then when you are enticed, and then you make the mistake of acting upon that particular thing, then it becomes a problem. But if you look, you know, but if you, if you continue to attack, you, if you engage it, that's when it becomes a problem. That's one of the things I want you to understand is that you cannot stop people from saying anything around you. You can't stop them from putting ideas into your head. What you have control over is what you can do with what has been spoken in your ears. Are you willing to listen? Or are you willing to brush it aside? Are you willing to allow it to take root in your heart? So James is saying our action is critical in the steps, you know, in the step of uh, the, in the, in the, in the, in the in the process of in the process of, uh, of temptation. That is why the Bible tells us 
in verse number 15. He said, when desire has conceived. In other words, as soon as you take the suggestion of the devil. As soon as you move from that suggestion and you begin to think about it. And you begin to act upon it. That particular suggestion ceases to be a temptation. It now becomes an act. And as soon as you act, you are no longer innocent. As soon as you act, you are immediately accountable for your action. So please understand. Being, you know, being tempted is not the problem. What you do when you are tempted is where the main challenge is. It is not a question of what the ideas that somebody tells you. What are you doing with the idea? That is the problem. And thinking of this particular evil thought does not necessarily mean that you are committing sin. It simply means that when you act upon it, that's when the problem comes. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, if you start reading from verse number 15. He said, for we have a high priest which cannot be touched. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. But was in all point tempted like as we are, yet without sin. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was tempted in every way possible, but he did not sin. You know the story of when he went into the wilderness and the devil came. He said, turn stone to bread. He refused. He said, jump. He said, refuse. Bow down. He refused. Because he will not yield unto temptation. Devil tried to sow the seed and suggestion into the mind of Christ. But Christ refused to take the bait of the devil. Christ refused to act on devil's suggestion. That tells us that temptation in and of itself is not the same. It is our response. It is our engagement. It is what we do with the temptation that makes the difference. Now, why is this important for you to understand? It is important because knowing how temptation works helps you to stop the process. When somebody tells you it is, ah, this is a very good deal. It actually is too good to be true. You better believe it. It is actually too good to be true. Because whatever is tempting you to act outside of your normal course of action is something that should stop you for analysis. So when you understand the process of temptation, it helps you to stop the process. Number two, when you know how temptation works, it helps you to fortify yourself. So that you don't become a prey in the hands of the wicked one. When you know how temptation works, it helps you to overcome temptation so that you do not become a victim in life. The question this evening then, how do you overcome temptation? How do you overcome temptation? Number one, you overcome temptation by identifying your own tendencies and your own proclivities. In other words, we all know ourselves. Some of us know that we become, you know, we, 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 we know our weaknesses. We know where we are weak. We know where we can fall if we are exposed to those things. The most important thing is to identify those areas. And number two, you know the things that trigger you. There are some of us, all you have to say is one or two words and we go into a fit of rage. You should be able to know yourself that you have anger problem, know what triggers it, and then confront that particular issue at the source. Deal with it at the source. The Bible says that keep your heart with all diligence for out of it comes the issue of life. Make sure that you do not allow that trigger, that thing that makes you to say the things you don't want to say, that thing that makes you go angry, that makes you, make you go ballistic, that thing that makes you to put your eyes into what does not belong unto you. Know the trigger and make sure you cut it off. And then feed your mind and your heart and reinforce your mind and your heart with the word of God. The Bible says out of the treasure out of the good treasures of a man, of, a, of his heart, bring forth a good man. Out of the good treasures of his heart, bring forth good fruits. Because out of the abundance of the mouth, of the heart, the mouth speaks. So fill your heart with those things that will make you not to fall into temptation. Then finally, rely on the power of the Spirit because the Bible says, by strength, no man shall prevail. My brothers and sisters, I want you to understand one thing. Victory over temptation becomes a reality when you know the point of recognition. When you come to that point of recognition that you are a man, I am a man. I'm, I'm susceptible to making mistakes. I am exposed all my life to temptation. And I have to come to that realization. The day that you believe that you are now above temptation, that is the day that you are fallen. So victory over temptation comes at the point of recognition. Number two, it comes at the point of acceptance. You accept the fact that you are a human being just like any other person. 
And many of us who have, who have been close to us in this church, you know I gave you, I give the analogy, I say, if you cut my hand here, you will see blood come out. We are all humans. That means we are all open to this point of the, to this particular, to this challenge that face all human beings. So please come to that point of acceptance so that you do not become too proud in your own self and too believing that you can never fall. And then finally, you, you know, victory over temptation comes at the point of resolution. The point where you make up your mind. Now, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. I will not allow temptation to overcome me. Now, Lord, I will walk with you. I will not allow the enemy to have the final say. Every now and then, one will fall, but you will not remain. You will not remain on the floor. You come to that point of resolution. When you come to a point of recognition, you come to a point of acceptance, and you come to a point of recognition, becomes diff- it becomes very difficult for temptation that pull others down to pull you down because you have made up your mind that you are going to fight. For as long as you are standing. With the help of God. You are not going to be a prey in the hands of the enemy. So as we close this evening. Please understand. That temptation in itself. Is not the problem. Your response to that. To that temptation. Is the problem. When the enemy tells you to jump. What do you do? When the enemy tells you to take what does not belong to you, what do you do? When he asks you to look at what you are not supposed to look at, what do you do? When he asks you to say things you are not supposed to say, what do you do? Temptation will come. The enemy will make suggestions. There's nothing you can do about that. But what you can do is how you respond to those particular suggestions of the enemy. The question this evening is that, are you determined to stop the process of temptation from producing the fruits of destruction in your life. Are you determined to be able to say. That Lord temptation will not produce. Will not conceive. So that sin does not lead me into death. Are you determined to do that? Because unless you are resolved. You will find that I will continue to wrestle. And fall and rise every day. And that will not be your portion in Jesus name. Let's bow our heads as we talk to the almighty God.